Good evening, everyone. And thank you all for being here. I'm Raihan Salam, president of the Manhattan Institute, and it is my great honor to debut the City Journal Awards, our tribute to the nation's most fearless journal of public affairs and to the women and men who exemplify its commitment to intellectual independence and civic courage. City Journal was first launched by the Institute in 1989 at a moment when the conventional wisdom held that America's great cities were fundamentally ungovernable. Faced with rising crime and soaring welfare roles, there was a widespread sense that the social problems faced by the American city were beyond the control of City Hall, that municipal governments were simply not up to the challenge of imposing order on the streets. Against this backdrop, a small coterie of brilliant contrarians, including my distinguished predecessors Bill Hammett and Larry Moan, decided that enough was enough, that the time for excuses had come to an end, and that a small magazine was capable of sparking big change. City Journal's founding conviction was that there was nothing inevitable about the decline of New York and other urban centers, that the deterioration of public safety, the lowering of expectations in our schools, and the across-the-board surrender of civilized standards of conduct were choices made by political and civic leaders, choices informed by ideological beliefs that deserve to be taken seriously and vigorously challenged. City Journal's job was to point to how America's great cities and leading institutions could be governed differently to break them out of a state of persistent decline. The magazine called upon leaders with backbone to make different choices, choices grounded in evidence, in respect for the power of incentives, and in a clear-eyed recognition of human frailties and human potential. In the years since, City Journal has done all that and more, serving as a font of transformative ideas on crime fighting, social welfare, higher education, public sector reform, and much else. It has offered detailed playbooks for breathing life into our cities and civic institutions. And it has brought to light the work of our nation's most brilliant thinkers and leaders, people like Heather McDonald and Bill Barr, tonight's honorees. None of this work would be possible without the steadfast support of our friends and trustees, many of whom are with us tonight, and the leadership and commitment of our chairman, Paul Singer. Before I step aside, I'd like to briefly introduce him. Since launching his firm, Elliott Investment Management, in 1977, Paul has been one of the world's most successful investors. A prolific and far-sighted philanthropist, he has invested in developing future leaders and building innovative organizations in policy, politics, journalism, and Jewish life. As chairman of MI, he has been a staunch defender of shareholder capitalism, economic freedom, and the rule of law, and an indispensable partner in our efforts to make City Journal the intellectual powerhouse it is today. Please join me in welcoming Paul Singer to the stage. Thanks, Ryan, for that um, exceedingly kind um, uh, and generous introduction. Um, and it's really a pleasure to be here tonight at the inaugural City Journal Awards Dinner. You know, these are complicated times. Inflation is raging. Crime is through the roof. Schools are failing to educate our children. Homeless, homelessness is surging. And the city is on the precipice of bankruptcy and solvency. Um, there was a, um, uh, a, a quote which um, uh, summarizes uh, the situation that we find ourselves in by the noted historian and philosopher Alan Konigsberg. Quote, and I quote, mankind faces a crossroads. One path leads to despair and utter hopelessness, the other to total extinction. <laughs> Let us pray that we have the wisdom to choose correctly. <laughs> Somebody over there grew up with Woody Allen. <laughs> the lights are... Uh... Brian, uh, it would be an, un uh, an understatement to say that you and your team have your work cut out for you. But we have confidence that the City Journal 
and its int uh, intrepid team of writers and editors will save this city or at least supply the uh, policy ideas um, and policies that can save the city. The work that the Manhattan Institute and City Journal uh, has done uh, uh, has been indispensable for more than three decades as being the venue for creative solutions to our most pressing policy uh, issues and home to sharp criticism, sharp social criticism, and uh, um, uh, good debate. Uh, it truly is a unique asset for the city um, uh, and a unique asset that enables MI scholars and outside contributors to drive the discussion around urban policy. We're here tonight to particularly recognize two magnificent individuals. In cities across the country, the results of the soft on crime approach to prosecution and policing have been bared for all to see. When I think soft on crime, the names Heather McDonald and Attorney General Bill Barr do not come to mind. <laughs> As to Heather McDonald, we're so lucky that she's on our side. She is, through her published work in commentary, uh, sorry, <laughs> City Journal and elsewhere, um, the most persuasive defender of the rule of law and the measures necessary to ensure public safety. Thank you, Heather. Attorney General Barr has proven to be the most effective practitioner in a generation of the policies that promote the rule of law and public safety. And for that, we're grateful. Thank you, Mr. Attorney General. We honor you both for your moral courage, your fortitude, and your public spiritedness, traits needed now more than ever. We're also here tonight to celebrate City Journal's success and honor its writers, editors, and supporters. City Journal's breadth of subject matter and fear, fierce adherence to independent thinking are things to be cherished. And we have here MI trustees and donors who have helped make made its existence and it, this success possible. Indeed, we're grateful to everyone here for your commitment to and generosity and service to our important mission. Thank you very much. As we continue with our program, I'd like to introduce Brian Anderson, the editor of City Journal. I'm just here for a second. Uh, the editor of City Journal. For almost 25 years, he has played an indispensable role in the growth of City Journal's audience and impact. Brian first joined City Journal in 1997, and he became the publication's editor-in-chief in 2007. In the ensuing 15 years, he's overseen the robust expansion of the journal's website, bringing in new talent to advance its vision of urban flourishing, economic opportunity, and cultural excellence. At its founding, CJ had no more than a few thousand readers. Today, it boasts millions of readers across print and online and publishes over 800 pieces a year, each of which is held to Brian's exacting standards. Under Brian, City Journal has become a daily enterprise, not just a quarterly one. Yet the quarterly print magazine remains central to CJ, featuring in-depth, groundbreaking journalism from the most thoughtful writers of our time, journalism that has enlivened public discourse, held powerful institutions to account, and sparked reform movements in communities throughout the country. In addition to his editing duties, Brian hosts CJ's 10 Blocks podcast, A Haven for Intelligent Conversation, and he's written influential essays and books, including South Park Conservatives and A Manifesto for Media Freedom, both of which are fitting for today's celebration of free speech, intellectual curiosity, and open debate. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Brian Anderson. Well, thank you, Ryan, for your very nice introduction, and uh, Paul Singer for your warm words about the magazine as well. 
and thanks uh, to all of you for coming tonight. Uh, for everyone who's here to celebrate our honorees, it's great to see all of you and, and so many friends. Uh, City Journal has indeed expanded since I've joined. We've gone from being a small quarterly magazine that punches well above our weight to being a daily website that still punches above our weight, I'd like to think. We now publish, as Ryan was saying, uh, a lot of articles, four a day, in fact, approaching the output of a newspaper editorial page. And of course, every quarter we still turn in the print magazine on time or, or very close to it. <laughs> this, this issue is going to be late because we've been involved with this event, so whatever. Uh, that kind of expansion wouldn't be possible without our fantastic stable of writers and contributing editors, many of whom are here tonight, or our hardworking editorial team, Paul Beston, Steve Malanga, uh, T Teddy Kupfer, who we stole from National Review, uh, Dan, Dan Canelli, and Madeline Miller. And it, it certainly wouldn't be possible without the enthusiastic institutional support and intellectual independence that our publisher, the Manhattan Institute, and its generous trustees afford us. Under Raihan and Alana, and under their predecessors, Larry Moan and Vanessa Mendoza, who are here tonight. Uh, we're, we're really grateful to everyone who keeps City Journal flourishing, in other words. Our first awardee tonight is William Barr. Mr. Barr is a native New Yorker and earned his undergraduate and master's degrees at Columbia. After working for a time as an analyst at the CIA, and I can see the conspiratorial <laughs> tweets tomorrow. <laughs> right, yes. <laughs> I don't think it was that CIA. Earning a law degree from George Washington University, obtaining a prestigious federal clerkship and practicing law, he began a long and distinguished career in public service, culminating in his appointments to United States Attorney General not once but twice under Presidents George H.W. Bush and Donald Trump. He's also spent time in the private sector, including with Verizon and Time Warner. Throughout his career, He's been a tireless champion of the U.S. Constitution and a devoted advocate of public order and religious liberty. William Barr's first stint as Attorney General came during the first Bush administration. He was the 77th person to hold the job and served from 1991 to 1993. Now, if you cast your mind back, that was a dark time in many ways. You'll recall that this was a time when crime was perhaps the most urgent problem facing the United States. The homicide rate had been climbing for decades. More than 2,000 people were killed annually in New York City alone. Disorders span the country, however, with seven violent crimes for every 1,000 Americans each year, and no end appeared in sight. Yet the response in most sociology and criminology departments and in the opinion of countless lawmakers and the elite press amounted to little more than a passive shrug and maybe a lecture about the need to solve the, you know, the root causes of crime before any kind of progress could be made in dealing with the law and order problem. But then came the great crime decline, a truly dramatic shift that Attorney General Barr helped bring about. In an influential 1992 Justice Department report, he had argued forcefully that the incarceration of serious offenders is an indispensable tool for delivering not only justice to the perpetrators of crimes, but safety to those who bear the brunt of urban violence. The then unfashionable idea that the vigorous enforcement of the law could restore order and save lives eventually became a reality, one unfortunately under threat again today. Now you might also have heard about his more recent period in the Justice Department. In 2019 and in 2020, William Barr served in the Donald Trump administration as the 85th Attorney General. Having taken office amid widespread press conjecture that the 44th president might somehow have been a Russian asset, he oversaw a massive special counsel investigation, 
guarded the constitutional prerogatives of the executive branch and ultimately resolved the Russiagate matter. In public remarks, he defended the social order at a time of family breakdown, drug addiction, and mental despair. At a time of disdain for traditional morality, he not only spoke out for religious liberty, but set up a task force in the department to protect it. And during the horrendous rioting of 2020, he stood up for law enforcement and took on local and state officials who were encouraging urban anarchy. And from the beginning of his tenure until the end, amid intense pressure and controversy, he left little doubt that his principal loyalty was to the rule of law. So if the City Journal Awards exist to honor intellectual independence and civic courage, I can't think of a more fitting first recipient. So please, ladies and gentlemen, join me in congratulating William Barr. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for giving me this award. And um, also for giving it for moral courage and for the role I played in combating violent crime. But I just want to say a word up front about moral courage, which is that in, in these days, um, to serve in government, when we have the politics of personal destruction, it's difficult. And one of the reasons I ultimately decided to go in, because one of the most common questions I get is, why in the hell did you go into that administration? <laughs> and it's a question I ask myself as well. Um, and it took a long time to wrestle with this issue. And ultimately, the reason I went in is because I thought the country was headed toward a constitutional crisis. And I thought that there was an effort afoot to uh, drive a duly elected president from office, or at least hobble his administration. And that he was not being given his due as president and his chance to carry out his administration with the resistance and Russiagate. And uh, I came to the conclusion, after pushing a lot of other bodies in front of me, trying to get people interested in making them attorney general, that, it, <laughs> that at the end of the day, you know, I probably was in the best position to get confirmed and to help stabilize things. And I also felt that unlike the other candidates, I was at the end of my career. I was 69 years old. And at the end, I wasn't looking for another job. I would, you know, even if I was uh, 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 ostracized from society, I would still survive. So I thought I was in a place to deal with the current climate and go in and do what I thought was right. And that's what I said in my confirmation. I'm not going to be bullied by the president, by Congress, or editorial boards. I'm going to do what I think is right, period. Let the chips fall where they may. And I felt I could do that. <clears throat> But the people who really have moral courage are the many people who went into that administration, um, regular Republicans and conservative Republicans and so forth, who were in their 30s, 40s, and 50s and had their careers ahead of them and did all they could to have that administration succeed. And when they made a decision, they really had to worry about the, the impact on their lives and what effect it would have. Those are the people who really have moral, moral courage. And I think they did yeoman service in trying to help Trump uh, lead a successful administration and get reelected. And I am disappointed, bitterly disappointed, that he was not able to win that election. But I just wanted to say that because for me, uh, it wasn't as hard as for others. And the other thing is, I just never read the press. <laughs> and I'm serious. I didn't read it. I didn't watch TV except in a, on a, 
you know, sometimes when I was feeling a little down, I'd turn on Hannity or something like that. <laughs> but, but uh, so I thought I was doing great. And, <laughs> and uh, I would judge things by the expression on my press secretary's face when she came in. If she was very hangdog, I'd say, oh, something wrong? <laughs> So I was surprised that I was actually recognized when I left. I, I, you know, people recognized. The first time I was AG, no one recognized me except Washington lawyers on the street would sort of nod, you know, when I passed. But now, I, you know, anywhere I go, it's like people coming up to me. And at first I thought they'd be hostile. But actually, 98, 99% of the time, it's very pleasant, very pleasant. I tried to, I tried to conceal my identity the first time I went to the airport. I was I was a little nervous because I for the first time I didn't have the FBI guys around me, and so I went in disguise. I took off my trademark glasses, <laughs> and put on my my mask, and walked into Reagan Airport, and people just started streaming toward me. And the first for, the first guy said, "Thank you for your service. It was great. You know, I feel, felt better you were there." And I thought, "Oh, this," you know, and, and they started coming up. But it always perplexed me how they recognized me. Is there something about my physiognomy that <laughs> tips them off? But anyway. Um, I've always felt that the primary duty of government, the raison d'etre of the state, is to protect the physical security of its citizens, and it's the first duty of government, and uh, therefore I've both tours of Attorney General, this has been my main area of commitment, dealing with violent crime. And therefore, I am particularly honored to receive this award from the Manhattan Institute uh, and to uh, receive it along with Heather McDonald as co-honoree. Because in the fight against violent crime, there has been no steadier and, and uh, stauncher comrade in arms on the field than the Manhattan Institute. And I go back to even my, my first uh, tour as Attorney General. The Institute's uh, careful empirical analysis, its clarity and creativity of thought uh, helped frame my own thinking on the issue of violent crime and, and shape the approaches that have proven to be successful in the past. And over the past two decades, there's never been a bolder and more incisive thought leader on this subject than Heather McDonald. <clears throat> I told Heather, and this is the truth, that I clip her articles, I keep, I keep a file of her material, and even while I was attorney general, I would download the YouTube videos where she laid out her analysis and I'd watch it uh, religiously. And uh, she, she is just uh, an amazing thought leader. And I was also gratified to see the work by Rafael Manguel, <clears throat> who, who honored me by asking me to review his, look, I don't mean write a book review, but look at his book and write a blurb for the back, and it's, it's just a wonderful book. Uh, so the Institute is carrying on its tradition, really, of being leaders in this area. Um, the problem of predatory violent crime is one of these issues that uh, there's an obvious and effective solution to. And there's no mystery as to how to reduce violent crime. It's really a question of will. And before 1960, crime in the United States was relatively modest and stable. Starting in 1960, it quintupled over the next three decades. Quintupled. And most of the increase occurred during the 60s and 70s. During the Reagan administration, we started to flatten that curve, but it was still going up. And while this was happening, while crime was soaring, incarceration rates were dropping. These were not unrelated phenomena. Um, so 
By 1991, when I first became Attorney General, the violent crime had reached its all-time high in the United States. And all the empirical data, and I studied this question intensely during this period, all the data, all the real world experience showed clearly what the problem was. The vast majority of predatory violence is committed by a tiny fraction uh, of the population, people who are habitual offenders. This small cohort is probably in the range of 1% to 2%. And studies from other countries confirm this finding. And it's clear to me that the prime, and it was always clear to me, that the primary goal uh, of the criminal justice system must be to identify, target, and incapacitate this group of offenders by making them serve substantial sentences that are dictated by the imperative of protecting the public. So, I thought if we were going to ever get a grasp on violent crime, and as I said, we were at record levels, if we were ever to do it in our, in our lifetime, in our children's lifetime, uh, we had to pursue this policy of incapacitation. And so we embarked on a three-pronged pr uh, strategy of growing state, federal, local task forces uh, where we would go after the most violent offenders and prosecute them under federal law, firearms law, drug law, gang laws, uh, with the purpose of incapacitating them. And by the time I left office, we were charging 1,000 a month. Uh, and in a year and a half, we had 18,000 charged, taking off the, taken off the streets. Um, the other thing we did was have neighborhood by neighborhood approach we called it weed and seed, where we tried to focus law enforcement and coordinate them with social programs and get the local natural leadership of the neighborhood involved. And this proved very successful for as long as we were able to carry it out. And finally, we spearhead, spearheaded, and this carried over from the Reagan administration, a national effort for the states to stop their revolving door justice and to adopt tough systems more like the federal government. We had victims groups involved and all the law enforcement community involved. And we started getting those reforms passed. Uh, and while our tenure was cut short by, uh, by our defeat in 1992, subsequent events, I think, have proven uh, that this was the correct approach. Starting in 1991 and 1992, the, the prison population in the United States doubled. Uh, over the next two decades. And predictably, crime plummeted. And for 22 consecutive years, starting with 1991 and 1992, crime fell every single year. So that by 2014, it had been cut in half. And lo and behold, the prison population, as I said, had doubled. Now, of course, the left wants crime rates got down to, you know, pseudo-tolerable levels, you know, saying, we have lower crime than ever before, and now, and yet, we have all these people in prison. <laughs> and you say, well, how about you saying, because we have all these people in prison. I just point out that Raphael and we were talking earlier about this Swedish study in 2015. In Sweden, which is you know, not as violent as the United States, they've determined that 1% of the population is responsible for 63% of the crime. So in the United States, as I say, I think it's between 1% and 2%, but let's take 1%. That's 3.5 million people. We have a ways to go before we have 3.5 million people in prison. And I only say that a little bit tongue-in-cheek. We, we have about half that number. <clears throat> um, anyway, 2014, this came to a screeching halt with the Obama, uh, 2014, Obama administration comes in, starts their war on police, uh, and, you know, uh, influenced by all the soft-headed liberal uh, policies, soft on crime policies, and crime started going up for the first time in 22 years, and it was going up when uh, Trump came into office. 
and Sessions and I were able to get it back down. So every year under Trump, <laughs> going back to those policies, the incapacitation policy, we were able to reduce crime and then all hell broke loose in 2020 with the BLM riots and with COVID. Uh, but, and, 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 and now once again, we have increasing crime and there's no end in sight. Just as on the border, the administration is sitting there without any policy, without any direction, crime is going up and I don't see anything that's going to turn that around. Um, now, the progressive left's position on it is, as um, Brian mentioned, let's address the root causes of crime. And this is tire tiresome and predictable, but it's, you know, instead of locking people up, we should be building schools. Instead of more police, we should be hiring more teachers and social workers. This is always presented as an alternative, that it's either tough law enforcement or addressing the root causes. But this is a false dichotomy, because even if we were capable of figuring out uh, uh, social programs that, that could, tr could contribute to the reduction in crime, uh, they're not a substitute for tough law enforcement uh, because tough law enforcement has to be the foundation um, of any program uh, that is capable of reducing crime or alleviating some of the conditions that may lead to crime. It's a necessary pr prerequisite to social progress. So over the main door of justice is this quote from Pliny saying, from law and order, everything else arises. And law enforcement, safe neighborhoods have to be the foundation on which we build everything else. So today the carnage is into intolerable as it was in 1991 and 1992. And it's nice to hope that we can figure out somehow to, to make a more peaceful society uh, but citizens need to be protected today. The blood is flowing today. They deserve to be protected. And any approach, any social program approach, even if you could figure out what to do, would take generations to have an impact. And the question really is, how do you stop the slaughter here and now? And schools and social workers are not an adequate answer to that question. And more fundamentally, uh, in the pervasive atmosphere of violence and fear, even the best designed social programs cannot take root. What good is it to build a school, a brand new school in an inner city community if it's run by gangs? Or try to attract new businesses into communities when the sh streets are shooting galleries? You know, it was once a shibboleth that poverty causes crime, but I think uh, the opposite is true, that crime causes poverty. Uh, I just want to say at the end here that something about police, because we're facing a real crisis in the policing profession in the United States. The progressive jihad against police officers has already done massive damage to the profession. And this harm, this harm is gonna persist for a long time, even after we succeed in reversing the, the uh, wrong-headed uh, progressive policies otherwise in the law enforcement arena. Even in the best of times, there's no more challenging vocation than serving as a police officer. It requires commitment, courage, and the patience of Job. And those attracted to this profession are by and large civic-minded men and women with a strong desire to serve and protect their fellow citizens. The constant stress imposes huge wear and tear on the officers and their family life. And suicide rates, as we all know, are skyrocketing among police. 
Police are being called upon to pick up the pieces where others have failed. Homelessness, drug addiction, domestic violence, and mental illness, all the grim harvest of uh, decades of progressive policies. But even before the recent abuses hurled against the police, it was becoming harder to attract and retain officers. But the scapegoating of police that has been going on today is making it nearly impossible to recruit officers of high caliber that our communities need with the requisite intelligence and good judgment and self-control. I'm being told today by sheriffs and chiefs of police departments in many jurisdictions that they are already dangerously understaffed and they cannot find new qualified recruits. Some of them have said men are no longer applying at all. It's mainly women applicants now to fill these slots. There's nothing wrong with that, but it, there should be some balance. We, getting, we, we are risking getting caught in this destructive cycle because as the job becomes more unattractive and we're forced to bring in marginal candidates so we can field adequate forces, we can expect even more instances of poor judgment by police, which will in turn result in even more recrimination and attacks on the police. And we have to pay attention to supporting the police and changing public attitudes toward the police just as much as we do in defeating the left's harebrained policy agenda. Uh, it's all driven by this big lie, of course, that police are essentially racists who are gratuitously gunning down unarmed black men, which, as you all know, the data simply refutes. 95% of the interactions that lead to shooting, killing, of a suspect, in 95% of the cases, the suspect is armed with a dangerous weapon. And the other 5%, almost all of them involve suspects who are either running toward, charging at, or actually physically fighting the police officer or refusing to show their hands and making motions that lead the officer to believe it's a gun. The number of cases a year that come up where there's no reasonable explanation, at least at, at first glance, are a handful. We call on the police to uh, go into these potentially dangerous situations where they have to make shoot, no shoot decisions in less than a second. And we owe them the benefit of the doubt and the protection of qualified immunity. Without qualified immunity, we're not going to have police. You know, and I, I pointed it, when I was growing up during the Vietnam War, people were spitting on our soldiers. And it took America a while to realize how contemptible that was. And now people thank soldiers for their service. And we let them board the airlines first. And we should do all of that. But shouldn't we also honor those who serve as our police officers? Because it takes a special kind of courage to serve as a police officer. Soldiers, at least, are deployed for a fixed period of time to the front and during which they face mortal danger. But police officers, their tour of duty is every day they're a police officer. They roll out of the precinct and they're always exposed to sudden mortal danger. Um, and for them, there's no final victory. Crime is always there and they're always combating it. And if communities don't start honoring and supporting their police, they're just not going to have any police forces. It's that simple. So let me close by thanking again the uh, Manhattan Institute for the superb work it does on crime, as well as a myriad of other uh, issues that confront us. And thank all of you who support the work of the Manhattan Institute. It's critical. And uh, we ha now more than ever, we need this work being done to bring our country back from the brink. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please be seated. Thank you.
I'm, um, I'm really happy to be able to introduce our second honoree tonight, City Journal's own Heather McDonald. Uh, Heather is the Thomas W. Smith Fellow at the Manhattan Institute, and she's been a writer for the magazine since 1992. And I speak for Paul and my other editors when I say it's always exciting when one of her stories arrives. We know that it's going to be eye-opening and vigorously written, and that we're always going to learn something. Uh, from the very beginning of her career, she's been a seismic intellectual force. Now, Heather could have easily been an accomplished academic. She studied literature at Yale with, among others, the deconstructionist Paul DeMann. Heather continued her education at Cambridge on a Mellon Fellowship before returning to Yale to begin a literature PhD. By then, though, she had come to find the deconstructive approach empty. It was at once uh, frivolous and nihilistic. It denied literature beauty and meaning. She took a leave of absence from the program, and she never returned. But Heather could also have been a successful lawyer or judge. She then went on to earn a law degree from Stanford, and she actually clerked for Judge Stephen Reinhardt of the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. But examining contracts and cases ultimately did not appeal to her either. She began de dedicating herself to describing the reality of life outside the text, as she once put it. And she's done this as a journalist and public intellectual, learning as she went along from her own reporting on urban policy. And what a reporter she's turned out to be. Nearly 500 City Journal articles and essays and countless op-eds for leading publications later. Wall Street Journal, New York Post, almost every major publication in the country. Covering everything from crime and punishment to misguided philanthropy to bad legal thinking to welfare reform to the educational malpractice that drove her from academia. But also celebrating and defending the cultural and artistic genius of the West that is being squandered. Now, Heather is truly a fearless journalist. She goes straight to the source, to the reality of life outside the text to get the story. So covering the explosion of violence on Chicago's South Side, she hit the streets alone, talking with neighborhood residents, including the mother of a teen killer, and corner drug dealers. An essay on California's prisons was filled with Heather's multiple interviews with violent gang members, including one, if I remember correctly, with a forehead tattoo with an obscenity. For another memorable story, Heather navigated San Francisco's squalid homeless encampments, and to get a sense of the drug market there, she even purchased some fentanyl from a ten tenderloin district dealer. Now, this is dedicated reporting. <laughs> An addict whom Heather observed digging for a vein in his hand verified the authenticity of her purchase, which I think was $16, if I remember correctly. Now, these were stories about public policy with lots of data. A progressive writer for Mother Jones once grudgingly acknowledged that just about every one of Heather's stories was, quote, a statistical an analytical tour de force. But they are also vivid with observed detail and human beings, human voices. Her ability to combine these things is why George Will has called her America's indispensable journalist. And David Brooks has said that if there were any justice in the world, McDonald would be knee deep in Pulitzers and National Magazine Awards for her pioneering work. Now, Heather obviously has never ducked controversy. After Michael Brown was fatally shot by a Ferguson, Missouri police officer in August 2014, triggering local riots and a false national narrative about lethally racist police, Heather warned that what she famously dubbed the Ferguson effect 
would cause a law enforcement pullback. A new crime wave would result, she predicted, and tragically, she was right. Her 2016 book, The War on Cops, became a bestseller because it unf unflinchingly told the truth about policing and race and crime, as she's done for decades now. Heather's subsequent book, The Diversity Delusion, reflects another major current of her thought, showing how the university obsession with racial and gender diversity is helping no one. Indeed, it's creating a generation of purported victims who are now bringing their pathologies into the workplace and replacing the great Western ideal of a humanistic education with thought control. Her next book, out next year, focuses on the corruption of the arts and sciences by such destructive thinking. Now, all this has made Heather an enemy of the woke, as we now call them. She discovered this very directly at Claremont McKenna College in 2017, when angry pro protesters disrupted her speech, shouting, hey, hey, ho, ho, Heather Mack has got to go. Concerned for her safety, police swept her from the scene. Now, over 30 years of scrupulous and groundbreaking reporting, Heather has won many awards, including the Bradley Prize. I'm very proud to add to that list one of the initial City Journal Awards. So uh, please join me in congratulating Heather McDonald. so much. Thank you so much. I still have that fentanyl, by the way. <laughs> it's in a shoebox in my closet in uh, Irvine, California. Um, I'm waiting for the market price to rise just enough when I, I'll re-enter the market and see how I do. <laughs> to be honored by this magnificent institution and speaking before this magnificent audience, reminds me why New York City is still one of the greatest cities on earth. The people in this room, public spirited, deeply informed, generous, cannot be replicated anywhere else. It is a particular thrill to share the podium with William Barr, a man whom I have long admired, not least for his efforts to honorably meet the challenges of the Trump era and those please God, of the post-Trump era. <laughs> if the character of a man can be gauged by the quality of the enemies he has made, well, Mr. Barr has made all the right enemies. <laughs> and friends too, of course. <laughs> Let me begin by stating a few truths. The expectation of public safety is not a manifestation of white privilege. It is a civilizational right. Wanting to live in a clean, orderly environment is not a form of racism, it is a form of sanity. <laughs> when you stop enforcing the law, you don't get justice, you get anarchy. When I started writing for City Journal in the early 1990s, these truths were routinely denied and denounced. They then thankfully, almost miraculously, assumed their rightful place in urban governance. Yet now, they are being denounced and denied again. Tonight, I want to trace City Journal's role in that historical arc, and less momentously, in my own political education. In the early 1990s, I was still a liberal by default. In other words, a classic product of elite coastal culture, predictably ignorant about the need for law and order and the importance of personal responsibility. But when Myron Magnet gave me my first assignment, to find out what was happening on the Upper West Side where a mentally ill crack addict named Larry Hogue was terrorizing the neighborhood. Sound familiar? I did grasp one thing accurately, that I knew virtually nothing about public policy. So I figured that my only value added was to get out onto the streets, talk to as many people as I could, and let them educate me about their lives and the government programs that affected them. Lo and behold, an entire world opened up that I'd never read about in the New York Times. 
One welfare recipient told me that welfare mothers, i.e. her fellow recipients, were having more babies just to qualify for a bigger monthly check. A homeless shelter resident warned, government aid is a narcotic. Received liberal wisdom held that the entitlement mentality was a figment of the heartless conservative imagination. Yet here was a man outside a public assistance office who told me that he had been living off his girlfriend's welfare money, but was now applying for his very own food stamps. I'm going for every dime I can get out of them, he said, though adding with an exquisite sense of principle, quote, if they make you work, I'm not doing it. The clients of the welfare state, in other words, were explicitly confirming the conservative critique of the welfare state, a critique that I had never come across in my years of high-priced education. New York City was at that time undergoing the most consequential transformation in its history. Rudolph Giuliani had been elected mayor in 1993 on a promise to restore order to a city where homicides topped 2,000 a year, where one in seven residents was on welfare, where children slept in bathtubs to avoid stray bullets, and where Manhattanites posted pathetic signs in their cars reading, no radio, hoping, begging for mercy from the circumambient themes, thieves. Much of that description too now sounds all too familiar. Changing the early 1990s status quo required hand-to-hand -hand combat with the left-wing establishment. Giuliani was only too happy to fight, and City Journal only too happy to provide him with ammunition. City Journal was the ideas laboratory for the revolution, whether regarding broken windows policing or welfare reform. The poverty industrial complex and the criminals are victims lobby we're not going to go down quietly, however. With a united cry of rage, they rose up to block Giuliani's progress. And nowhere was the pushback more fevered than in the area of law enforcement. By the late 1990s, New York City crime had dropped over 50%. According to the advocates, that drop was accomplished through oppression and brutality. The New York Times maintained that the NYPD was wantonly killing minority males. By then, I had learned enough to know that if our newspaper of record asserted something, it should probably be checked out. <laughs> so I went into the most crime-plagued neighborhoods and talked to people on the street and in public housing projects. And I again heard voices that simply never made it into the mainstream media a 13-year-old boy waiting for a bus on Flatbush Avenue who faulted the police for not cracking down on gangbangers more aggressively, a cancer amputee in the Mount Hope section of the Bronx who said that the only time she felt safe to go into her building lobby to pick up her mail was when the police were there. Please, Jesus, she said, send more police. The NYPD was by then the most restrained big city police department in the country and regarded everywhere in the world, except in its hometown, as a model of professionalism. The press could not have been less interested. New York's crime drop, eventually 85% over two decades, saved thousands of minority lives. It spurred an economic renaissance, exactly as City Journal had predicted. By the mid-2010s, it seemed a sure bet that no future New York mayor would allow crime and chaos to go back up on his watch, since Giuliani and his successor, Mike Bloomberg, had proven that violence and disorder were not the natural condition of New York and other American cities. Such a bet, however, would have failed to anticipate Bill de Blasio or the national hysteria that broke out after the death of George Floyd in May 2020. In response to that death, the entire spectrum of American power from corporations and law firms to arts institutions and medical schools, declared that white supremacy defines the United States. When riots broke out in June 2020, the Democratic establishment either justified the mayhem, as Bill de Blasio did in New York, or ignored it entirely. If anyone has forgotten just how devastating that violence was, please read Attorney General Barr's book, one damn thing after another, which describes in chilling detail the hatred 
unleashed against police officers, business owners, and the institutions of government during the summer and fall of 2020. We have been living a slow motion riot ever since. Businesses are still looted following contested police shootings. Vandals are still driving trucks into storefronts to empty out the merchandise or simply walking into stores, confident and stripping the shelves, confident in their immunity from the law. Innocent pedestrians are being beaten with an incomprehensible savagery and police officers are being lethally ambushed. The criminal justice system doesn't respond as it should because if it did, police and prosecutors would be charged with racism. But when you stop enforcing the law, it is people like that cancer amputee in the Bronx who suffer the most. After the Giuliani Bloomberg interregnum, we are again putting the interests of the antisocial ahead of those of the law abiding. We should never apologize for insisting that everyone obey the law. We should never allow ourselves to be silenced. Yeah. We should never allow ourselves to be silenced by specious charges of racism. All victories, it seems, are fleeting. Battles won must be refought in the realm of policy detail and in the realm of principle. That is where City Journal and the Manhattan Institute become ever more vital. Our culture now tries to shut down debate and to stigmatize points of view contrary to current orthodoxies. This state of affairs is a more toxic version of the militant status quo that Mayor Giuliani set out to challenge. His City Journal-inspired triumph, however, can still be a beacon for the fight ahead. City Journal has allowed me to write about what I love as well as about what I deplore, about beauty as well as about its negation. I owe special thanks to Myron Magnet, whose profoundly considered conservatism shaped my awakening to political reality, to Brian Anderson, whose editorial entrepreneurship and acute judgment have taken City Journal's vision of urban grandeur and dynamism to new heights, and to Paul Beston, with whom I've thrashed out various cultural controversies, though I still lag on the topic of boxing. <laughs> City Journal has discovered and nurtured writers whose talents far surpass mine. If I named them all, we would never go home. The Manhattan Institute's donors and its leaders, Paul Singer, Raihan Salam, and Larry Moan before him, are responsible for the very existence of this precious institution whose ideas have changed lives. Thanks to City Journal's editors and to my fellow writers, I am more wise about the world than when I started. More important, City Journal's readers are more wise about the principles that must be with upheld if American civilization is to regain its vitality. Thank you, and thank you for supporting City Journal. Thank you so much. Thank you. When people ask me what turned around New York City, my first answer is City Journal. I mean, it really did save the city. City Journal is the nation's premier urban policy magazine. No doubt about it. When I have an investigative piece that's deeply researched, but too hot for other journals to touch, I know that City Journal will sponsor it and have my back. And for an investigative journalist, that's everything. City Journal is a rare place that combines intelligence with courage. All of the contributors are incredibly smart people, but what I think sets us apart is that we also have the courage uh, to transgress orthodoxy. City Journal makes a difference because it tells the truth. It's just that simple. What I love about City Journal is that it is open to so many kinds of ideas. I mean, it's open, it loves ideas that go against the prevailing narrative. City Journal in one word, fearless. If I had to describe City Journal in one word, I think I would use the word heterodox. City Journal's journalists have true moral courage and they're brilliant. They're brilliant. They're not afraid to tackle the hard issues like public safety, crime, critical race theory. They dig deeper than so many others are ever willing to do. Their investigative journalism 
It, it has and it continues to move the needle in our political landscape. People who are intelligent, they're engaged, they want to take their knowledge to the next level. Those are the folks that really read City Journal. And what's really great about City Journal as well is that people in positions of power and influence that shape public policy, uh, it's really their destination. If you want to learn more about what's going on in our nation's cities, in our culture, you have got to be reading City Journal. Good evening. I'm Alana Gallant, the Executive Vice President of the Manhattan Institute. Thank you all again for joining us tonight. As the video and our honorees demonstrated tonight, City Journal remains a singular voice in our country with its unique blend of thoughtful analysis and cutting edge investigative journalism. I want to recognize, as many others have, Ryan Anderson, Paul Beston, and the entire CJ team for their hard work in producing a publication with such significant impact. As Brian mentioned, CJ's readership, especially its online readership, has grown dramatically in recent years as more and more people look for honest journalism beyond partisan talking points. As we continue to expand CJ's offerings to meet the moment and to reach the widest possible audience, we would be grateful if you would consider making a gift to the magazine by using the pledge cards on your chairs. Thank you for your support and thank you for joining us. Please enjoy the rest of your evening. Good night.